Good morning. Ohayo Ozaimas. It is a privilege for me to present and moderate this spotlight session entitled Research of Music Therapy, Evidence and Story with well-known and leading research experts from Australia, Finland, and Korea. We are all aware of the importance and role of research to both the practice and profession of music therapy. Research challenges us to modify the way work as music therapies, helps define direction for new discoveries, reaffirms what we know, helps us change the way we view what we already know, and develops and supports jobs. It is these possibilities of discovery and change that make research so exciting and diverse. The practice of and profession of music therapy and the field of research are both diverse and growing areas that are intertwined. As new music therapy models, methods, techniques, or even equipment are proposed, there are parallel new evolving research methods and equipment to assess them. Music therapy research increasingly reflects this growing intertwined diversity and growth. Many research methods and approaches are currently used to examine the various facets of music therapy practice and theory. While the relationship between research and clinical practice of music therapy has been rather complex, Peters suggested that there are actually several similarities in how the two are conducted. I would like to echo many of you who believe that both researchers and clinicians have a contribution to make to the integration of research and practice. An increasing number of trained music therapy researchers and clinicians, therefore, from many parts of the world, have taken on the challenge of conducting research and are directly or inconsequentially influencing the music therapy journeys of others. The methods of music therapy research are generally part of a larger conception of research and of the underlying theoretical approach of the researcher with particular adaptations to the needs of music and music therapy. The presentations today will be an example of the diversity in music therapy research. The first presentation um, is going to be by Dr. Ju Chang, who will present a study she conducted which examined differences in surface EMG activity levels of forearm muscles associated with different keyboard playing tasks. Dr. Ju Shang from Korea is a fellow of the Association for Music and Imagery, is chair of music therapy department, graduate school, Ewa Women's University in Seoul, Korea. Professor Chung received her bachelor from Western Illinois University, her master's from Temple University, and her PhD from University of Kansas, all in music therapy. Dr. Chung is currently serving as the president of the Korean Music Therapy Education Association, editor for International Association for Music and Medicine. Her research interest involves music cognition, music rehabilitation, and music psychotherapy. Our second presenter, Dr. Jaco Erkila, will present his work on aspects of improvisational music therapy which have shown promising treatment possibilities for people who suffer from depression and anxiety. Dr. Jaco is professor of music therapy at the University of Jyväskylä, Finland. He runs the music therapy master's training and two clinical music therapy trainings. At the moment, his research focuses on improvisational music therapy for depression and anxiety, and he runs an Academy of Finland project on the topic. Our third presenter, Dr. Katrina McFerrin, will focus on research that investigates the questions of how and why, which are typical questions in projects conducting in the humanities. 
Dr. Maferran is head of music therapy at the University of Melbourne in Australia and co-director of the National Music Therapy Research Unit with Felicity Baker. She is also editor-in-chief of the open access online music therapy journal Voices with Mr. Stitch and Sue Hadley and sole creator of the massive open, open online course, How Music Can Change Your Life, through the Coursera platform. Katrina has been awarded more than $1 million by the Australian Research Council to conduct research about music and adolescence and has published more than 70 refereed journal articles and three books. These include her foundational text, Adolescence, Music and Music Therapy, with Jessica Kingsley Publishers in 2010, and Creating Music Cultures in the Schools, with Daphne Rickson and published bar by Barcelona Publishers in 2015. She is soon to publish two new texts, An Introduction to Music Therapy Research for Students, with Michael Silverman, published through AMTA in the US, and an Oxford University Press Handbook on Adolescent Music and Wellbeing, with Philippa Derrington and Suvi Sarikalio. I hope you will find their work enriching and inspiring to continue developing and expanding our models of music therapy research. Ultimately, it is through research that our clinical practice will develop, leading to the best music therapy services for our clients. It also will contribute to moving forward mu with music therapy and hopefully inspire new generations of researchers. At the end of the session, I will summarize the content of the presentations and it will be the time for your participation with questions. So please jot down any questions that may come up so that we can have a high and engaging discussion. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, express my gratitude toward Congress of Music Therapy for giving me this opportunity to share my study at this international event. When I received the theme of this spotlight session, which says evidence to story, I thought it was most suitable two key words that described music therapy. As an academic field, music therapy needs evidence and rationale. However, for the indigenous therapeutic aspect of music, we need stories. This is what differentiates music therapy from speech therapy when used singing, and also from occupational or physical therapy when used instrumental playing. It is the story of the music, music that makes us move and be intrinsically motivated. I think there can be stories ranging from very macro to micro level. Sounds can bring a subtle feeling or intense emotion related to memories and associations or any issues of here and now. For example, if I were to play or sing a tune such as la 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 there are quantifiable measures of acoustic aspects here. Frequency in hertz, loudness in decibel, waveform that determines the timbre, and other acoustic attributes. On the other hand, there can be story of tonal relationships and tonal episode. The first note serves as an onset for exposition, developing into climax with ascending note, and reaching resolution with descending notes. There is a start, flow, directionality, and ending. And there can be more than uh, just those acoustic attributes. There can be something about my voice, use of singing, and vocalization, and etc. So, much more than just acoustic attributes of sound in that singing a tune. So it is the research that helps us to balance 
this continuum from evidence to story. Today I'm excited to share a study that shows how music works the way it does with some understanding of its mechanism and how this working mechanism is reinforced and encouraged with personal stories in music. So there is combination of evidence and story. Iwa Women's University was built in 1886, 131 years ago. The name uses the singular form of woman because the university began with one female student back then and they want to keep the spirit that the university has a vision for each one of the students. The spirit was very important when music therapy was first established in 1997. This year marks the 20th anniversary of music therapy at IHWA. Now the university has about 25,000 female students, the largest women's university in Asia. The music therapy program at IHWA has research emphasis curriculum for exploring and discovering various aspects of mechanism between music and human functioning. IWA has two hospitals that collaborate with the music therapy department and they are such valuable resources for music therapy research and development. Under the music therapy department, we have IHWA Music Rehabilitation Center, EMRC, which researches various evidence related uh, to human musical behavior. Although we drive evidence that are objective, scientific, tangible, and overt, at the same time we have to look into what conduces that from the very first place. So I'd like to uh, take you back to the story again. I will show you a short video clip of a client with stroke having a session after the discharge, playing keyboard with music therapist accompaniment. You can see that the client had special meaning in the music that she plays, and this song was with her throughout her journey of stroke treatment. So there is much more than just a keyboard playing, pressing keys at different times. Some of you may have noticed the song that was played here. It is a hymn about love of God and has a very spiritual message in their lyric. Working with clients in the rehabilitation setting, we wanted to examine closely the basic mechanism behind keyboard playing. We already know that keyboard playing can be an effective method for rehabilitation after stroke. So we wanted to gather more evidence towards different playing patterns at different tempo for more strategic use of keyboard for stroke rehabilitation. Motor mechanism of keyboard involves multiple and complex motor movement, and it involves a highly controlled finger movements. When you play the keyboard, it executes auditory feedback, visual tracking, eye-hand coordination, and spatial perception, and others. Repetition of finger movement effectively mediate the activation of corresponding muscle and brain areas. Although you are using finger for pressing, key pressing movement facilitates coordinating movements of various forearm muscles. 
During playing, it involves kinematic control of joints to make optimal and efficient movement. Specific and intensive repetitive finger movements induce changes in functional muscular activities and cortical organization. Types of keyboard playing tasks and degree of intensity or repetition bring different outcomes of fine motor development. With this clinical rationale and premise, keyboard playing was applied to stroke patients. Stroke patients showed increased test scores on manual function and improved speed and accuracy of motor movement after repetitive finger exercises. Type of keyboard playing task, degree and intensity led to differential outcomes of fine motor development and rehabilitation. Individuated or sequential finger motions of keyboard playing are related to different interactions among fingers. Fingers aren't involved in a specific keystroke are also co-activated along with the finger intending to press the key during individuated playing. Sequential playing for timely constrained movement elicit anticipatory movements for single keystroke and timing of sequence plays a critical role. Different playing patterns, tempi, sequences, articulations affect different quality of keystroke for example, for fast playing, there would be maximum finger heights and more controlled movement. These differences can be shown with amplitudes of muscular activation via EMG, electromyographic patterns. However, the current literature have some limitations that no studies examine the differential effects of specific target movements incorporated into keyboard playing. We thought that the comparative analysis with regards to how relevant muscles are involved in different target movement would present baseline data for strategic use of keyboard for rehab setting. So our research question was, are there differences in mean surface EMG levels depending on the keyboard playing task. Are there differences in mean surface EMG levels depending on the tempo of keyboard playing? For this study, we recruited 10 healthy male adults. Male adults were selected because the study needs to measure EMG of developed muscles, and they tend to have more of those than female females. So they were all right-handed and no hand or finger injuries during past six months. The variables for measurement were key inter-keystroke interval, velocity, and surface EMG. Inter-keystroke interval was collected in each playing task condition with using MIDI keyboard by computing all the time intervals between two successive keystrokes in one trial of playing and averaging the intervals of all five keystrokes. Velocity of finger movement during each keystroke was measured. Surface EMG data of forearm muscles were acquired through an eight-channel wireless device. Five pair of, five pair of uh, surface electrodes were placed, three finger flexor muscles and two extensor muscles on each participant's dominant hand, and the ground electrodes were attached to the bony side of the back of the neck. This is the EMG setup. Electrodes placement, connection of eight-channel EMG system, playing on the MIDI connected keyboard, and the computing of EMG signals with maximum voluntary contraction, MVC, values. Electrodes were placed on the forearm, three on flexor muscle and two on extender muscles. One on the flexor carpi radialis, which flex and abduct hand. One on the flexor deuterum superficialis, 
which reflects digits two to five. One on the flexor pollicis longus, which flexes the thumb. One on extensor ditrum, which extends the wrist and fingers. One on the extensor pollicis longus, which extends the thumb. There were a total of five keyboard playing tasks in random order, and each task was played three times. They were individuated playing, sequential playing in successive pattern, and sequential playing in random pattern. For individuated playing, participants were instructed to play five notes from C to G using thumb, index, middle, ring, little finger, using verbal cues indicating which finger is to be played next. And there was intervals among these verbal cues. Individual task was played in self-paced preferred tempo. This was measured for research rationale that individuated playing does not employ anticipation of following cue stroke. For two sequential playing tasks, which are successive pattern and random pattern, the investigator explained the pattern to be played and the each participant practiced the pattern one or two times. For the successive pattern, each participant was instructed to depress key five keys using thumb, index, middle, ring, little finger sequentially without pausing. The random pattern was thumb, ring, index, little, middle finger with non-adjacent fingers. Both sequential tasks were played at two different tempi, self-paced preferred tempo and fast tempo. Now let's watch simple clips of each playing patterns. This is the individuated playing. This is sequential playing in a successive pattern. And this sequential playing in a random pattern. The result was as following. First, we examined the intercuse stroke interval between successive and random patterns. Significant differences showed in intercuse rope interval between tempo conditions for both patterns. Velocity is related to finger speed, usually resulting in changes in loudness. With regards to the velocity of each keystroke, the mean value measured during sequential playing at self-paced tempo were lower than those measured at fast tempo in both successive and random pattern conditions. Surface EMG values were examined for each playing patterns. Results show that for flexor deuterium superficialis, there was significant main effect of playing task. There was significantly greater muscle activation in sequential land random pattern than individuated pattern. For flexor carpi radialysis, there was no significant main effect of playing task. This level of its act, the level of its activation was rather consistent across finger playing patterns as it is the primary muscle that mediates wrist flexion. For flexor pollicis longus, there was significant main effect of the playing task and the significant difference was shown between individuated playing and sequential random playing. For extensor digits, there was significant main effect of playing task and a significant difference was shown between individuated playing and sequential successive playing. For extensor policies longer the thumb, there was significant main effect of playing task and the difference was shown between individuated playing and sequential successive playing and also with random playing. 
As you can see, the sequential playing in random pattern had most activating surface EMG. And this is a sequential playing in a random pattern. You can also see that the fast tempo elicited more activated surface EMG for both successive and random pattern. So this is the fast tempo. Different keyboard playing tasks involved different levels of muscular activity. There was a higher surface EMG activity level in sequential keyboard playing than the individuated playing, and also higher motor command in sequences of non-adjacent fingers. It also showed that tempo was a significant factor for muscular activity, indicating higher muscular activity in faster tempo than slower tempo. Oops. These results indicate that, that biomechanical analysis of finger movements in keyboard playing presents baseline data contributing to the determination of types, level, and intensity of multi-finger movements for improving dexterity and finger moral control. Now, all these statistics and basic research and evidence can only be useful if you can, if, if they can do something for desirable changes in human. So what we need to do is apply the derived data and findings into application. I'd like to show two video clips. One, a client playing a sequential successive pattern at the very beginning of keyboard rehabilitation, followed by a second video clip in which one gradually moving into music selection that has both successive and random pattern playing in the song. And you will notice the song that's a very familiar tune. And that music selection was something that was chosen by a client, which had a very special meaning for her. Okay, now comes the second one. Now you see how we moved from evidence to story. There was very, very much of meticulous statistics and methodology of collecting the EMG data, which I could not cover all in today's presentation. So if you are interested, it is published and available online. Before I end, I'd like to um, thank my colleague, <coughs> Professor Susie Kim, who's the director of EMRC, and one of the most passionate researchers I ever met. Having passionate researchers in our field of music therapy, the indigenous the identity of music therapy becomes more grounded with such integrity as an academic field. And I would like to convey my gratitude to all the music therapy researchers as someone who benefits so much from your findings of your hard work. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your interest.
Good morning, everyone. It's great honor to present here in this nice country. Uh, and, and I really want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is a great honor. Uh, in my presentation, I will discuss four themes uh, concerning music therapy for depression uh, with an improvisational approach as the main focus. First, possibilities, meaning and effect of music therapy in the treatment of depression and anxiety are considered. As we know, uh, depression is one of the areas of psychiatric music therapy that is relatively well researched because of the comorbidity between depression and anxiety, the latter is oft often included in the research activities. A topical question is what makes the effect? In other words, what are the internal mechanisms of music therapy in the given context? Here I will refer to our latest research activities in, in, in University of, of, of Uvascular. Also, models, methods, and techniques of music therapy will be briefly discussed. Here the main question is, is whether they are needed, and if yes, how far it is possible or worth of going in this respect how much we really have to make rules and, and, and create methods and techniques. Finally, the aspects of the clinical setup in improvisational music therapy will be discussed. One aspect being the compromises which sometimes must be made in the context of research, in, in particular when, when conducting randomized, randomized controlled trials. One of the benefits uh, of music therapy is that it makes uh, possible non-verbal and highly emotional working. In improvisational music therapy, this means that various non-verbal experiences such as images, associations, memories, and emotions occur while improvising. In a psychodynamic context, in particular, Phenomena such as transference and counter-transference responses play important roles in nonverbal musical expression and interaction. Though perhaps not necessary based on research evidence so far, some clinicians have noticed that certain clients in particular benefit from nonverbal symbolic working whereas there may be also those individuals for whom purely verbal ver or, or let's say verbal psychotherapy uh, may be more natural. Clinicians have also noticed that uh, the music therapy process may first be based more on music and musical expression and interaction, whereas later in the process the clients need for verbal processing may increase. A disorder such as depression often affects one's uh, verbal competence, especially in severe depression. And <clears throat> this may be one of the possible explanations for the findings that the amount of music and talking vary uh, within music therapeutic process. Anyway, the possibility of music therapy to allow musical, nonverbal, highly meaningful uh, working is an important and unique uh, feature of, of music therapy. Uh -huh. I guess, okay. I don't know what I did do. <laughs> one hit, 
and everything is lost. <laughs> ah, actually it is, it is there. Yeah, 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 great. Now we, we are on the same page. <coughs> there are various ways to try to illustrate the differences between music and language, the two auditive means of human expression and interaction. Music is often seen as more primitive or early type of expression and interaction, and in particular, modern developmental psycholo psychology has recognized the musical aspect and features of early interaction. You know, the writings by Daniel Stern, Colin Trivath, and those who are very important uh, uh, scholars also in the music therapy field. Clinical improvisation, one of the most typical music therapy methods, can be understood as playing with sounds. Uh, various kinds of dynamic forms or vitality affect, like Daniel Stern puts it, which have specific emotional and embodied meanings. Thus, depending on the musical and verbal domain, take turns in them, terms of their relative importance. Also, a kind of chick chak movement uh, between the two domains, music and language, is typical so that playing with sounds consisting of dynamic forms or vitality affect, whatever we, however we want to call them, may stimulate and trigger speech and vice versa as well. The question still remains whether some of the music therapy methods are superior to others in the treatment of depression and anxiety. This is due, it, due to the fact that music therapy trials on depression often are based on multi-method approaches where many of the methods are employed and not much can be said about their relative uh, significance. So it, it, is, it, it, it easily happens that the people are improvising, singing, playing, and, and, and doing so many things. And then it, it's hard to say what of these techniques makes the effect. The RCT we conducted uh, was the first one actually based solely on an improvisational approach and with no other mu music therapy methods included based on reductionist, a little bit reductionist uh, uh, starting point with some deviations and some compromises from everyday clinical practice. Our study showed that improvisational music therapy works even when carried out in this kind of little bit reductionistic way. Uh, <clears throat> we found uh, that improvisational music therapy as compared uh, to standard care was superior in terms of our primary uh, outcome measure, which was uh, montgomery Osberg depression scale. Uh, <clears throat> furthermore, we found that music therapy reduces anxiety significantly. Uh, <clears throat> and improves also global functioning. In addition, we found that the treatment response was twice as big in the experimental group than in the control, control group based on, 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 on our primary outcome measure, Montgomery Osberg depression scale. When dealing with <clears throat> internal mechanisms of music therapy, one important aspect is how we start the session. In addition to having some kind of conversation in a what's up right now style, <clears throat> there are also other ways to try to help the client to orientate to the session in an appropriate way. In our current research project, we are testing different 
warm up session opening methods. Uh, we are a method called R RFP, uh, resonance frequency breathing, shown it has shown to be very promising one. RFP, resonance frequency breathing, uh, is based on the idea that one spends 10 minutes engaging in specific breathing techniques consisting of six breathing cycles per minute. People are different in terms of the most appropriate cycle and the individual cycle must be carefully traced by using HRV, which, which actually means heart rate variability measure. I, I think most of you, 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 know, you know it. And, and when HRV is high, the condition is associated with calm, relaxed, and happy mood, which is something clinicians try to uh, achieve uh, normally for the clients, in particular at the beginning of the session. Whereas low HRV, on, on the other hand, is associated with stressed, anxious, uh, frustrated, and angry mood. In the pilot uh, conducted by our PhD student, Olivier Brabant, uh, interesting findings have been found. RFP indeed seems to lead to relaxed mood and task offers an optimal starting point for the music therapy session. In the figure, a very interesting finding is what happens when the client is improvising. Uh, you can see it on the, on, on the upper, upper uh, graph. Namely, it seems that improvising represents a very stressful activity for this client. When the client is talking, the mood is more relaxed again. This is, I would say, highly interesting dif difference because when we are comparing music therapy and verbal psychotherapy, what is the difference? What is unique in music? We can see when we are using physiological measures, we can see that these auditive uh, communication forms really differ in terms of, of uh, 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 physiological and emotional meaning. And this is, I think, the, the way how we should go, what, what, you sh what we should really study more. When uh, comparing several cases, we have found that RFP seems to be an adaptive intervention, intervention where the effect depends on the client's current emotional needs. An easy situation becomes more difficult and difficult situation becomes easier. Now we are talking about inverted U-shape, which, which you know from research literature. So it seems that talking and improvising really represent different types of experiences and that improvising sometimes may be stressful. Uh, obviously, triggering challenging emotions. When this is the case, we hypothesize that the introductory exercise, uh, in this case, resonance frequency breathing, may make this kind of challenging processing possible. Now the big question is whether facing difficult emotions often accompanied with challenging images or associations is important when treating a depressive client. In other words, can there be gain without pain? I would say all the people with depression, they have to meet the pain. This is a typical model of a possible improvisational music therapy session consisting of three different activities, warm-up, improvisation, and talking. For example, if the total length of the session is 60 minutes, this is how the session in principle could progress. Uh, <clears throat> when having an introductory exercise such as uh, R RFP, we think that 45 minutes is too short for the session because 
the introductory exercise actually takes 10, 15 minutes. So the ideal length of the session then is, is about 60 minutes. The idea of warm up activity, whether it is RFP or like you, you well know, some are using music listening, music relaxation techniques, or, or even various techniques, is that the activation gradually increases. We also think that the level of, of activation should decrease towards the end of the session so that the client can leave the therapy session with relatively calm mood. So the height of activation occurs around 35, 45 minutes into the session after which the last stage closing down the session takes place. Of course, this is kind of ideal model which sometimes doesn't occur due to many possible unexpected events. This is kind of kind of idealization. Uh, RCTs are seldom, if ever, mirror everyday music therapy practice because so many aspects need to be controlled. To investigate a phenomenon often implies that another phenomenon must be neglected. This is the case in particular with RCTs where researchers are not only interested in the overall effect of the intervention but also in its internal mechanisms. And needless to say, RCTs are expensive and thus processes are often relatively short. Normally, when, when you are conducting RCTs, you have money for 20 sessions for, let's say, 50 people and not much more. And we know, for instance, that in psychodynamic tradition, therapies uh, last for years. And, and, and this is one of the problems of RCTs because, because we really would need more time, but we don't have time. We don't have money, which means that we have to find the effect very quickly. And this is why we have to plan RCTs very carefully. This is just a short example of the clinical setup of our uh, IINT, like we call our model. It is integrative improvis improvisational music therapy. Simple mallet instruments, which are the same to both of the improvisers. In addition, drums are used, again, the same for both, to, to, to client, to therapist. In our setup, all the improvisations are recorded on the computer's hard disk by using traditional sequencing software. Both MIDI uh, and, and digital audio are recorded for subsequent computational analysis. Uh, <clears throat> we, we are not saying that uh, our IIMT model is a perfect model for depression, for anxiety. Something not, not uh, needed for further improved. We know that it works, but we want to further improve it. For instance, we know that because of many compromises we have had to make, it's not a perfect, perfect copy of everyday clinical practice. So one of the challenges is how we can get closer uh, to clinical practice when we are actually researching uh, something in, in music therapy. We really aim at saying many more things in 2020 when we will complete the current Academy of Finland project, No Pain, No Gain, uh, where internal mechanisms of IIMT are the focus. Some of the things 
we are considering, as has been illustrated in these presentations, are session-related issues, such as how to start the session, session structure, and also the many aspects of client therapist interaction and synchrony. Synchrony is very important issue. Also, outside music therapy, in verbal psychotherapy, researchers are really interested in the idea of synchrony, which basically means uh, bodily uh, and, and nonverbal, uh, mostly unconscious uh, activities. Uh, we will also focus on perceptual motor and physiological modalities without forgetting the experiences as they occur in therapeutic communication. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. We should sing. But we're here to talk about research. Thank you to the World Federation of Music Therapy and to the Japanese Music Therapy Association. It is an honour to be the person who gets the opportunity to stand here from amongst all of us that could have talked about this topic. And in doing so, I would like to acknowledge the many intersecting privileges that have brought me here. Uh, being a white Australian is an important part of that. Being cisgendered is an important part of that. In the context of this Congress, being a native English speaker is a real privilege and I appreciate your willingness to listen to me speak in English. I also come from a middle-class background and so there are many factors which have brought me today to the point where I would like to make an argument and a critique of the evidence-based movement. But I recognise that I do that from a position of relative power. That power has allowed me to become the head and professor of a marvellous team of academics at the University of Melbourne in Australia, which is the number one research university in our country, where we have a wonderful master's coursework program in music therapy. I work alongside a diverse, successful, productive and rather gorgeous team of people who embrace different approaches, worldviews, cultural backgrounds, genders, and so we often have the opportunity to debate the relative merits of music therapy research types. As part of the international community of music therapy researchers at this Congress and at many previous conferences and congresses, I've also been inspired by many diverse colleagues from around the world who perform an array of research approaches. In listening to this diversity, I've begun to form my own beliefs about evidence and story in research, and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share them with you today. Although I believe that the evidence-based movement was created with reasonably good intentions of encouraging practitioners to remain up to date with the latest research and breakthroughs, I believe it has become an oppressive system that has been given too much credence, perhaps especially within our profession. I don't agree with the idea that one type of research is better or more necessary than another. I do believe that all kinds of research have the potential to contribute to the generation of new knowledge. But the word evidence is now associated with a very narrow band of research types 
and it is not sufficient for a growing and creative profession. And it is certainly not sufficient for any discipline, including the academic study of music therapy. As a researcher, I believe, as I'm sure my colleagues also do, that the discovery of knowledge is an exciting and sometimes dangerous adventure. Researchers need to be courageous, curious and creative. In some countries, researchers can and have been thrown into jail by conservative governments who try to curtail their freedoms and restrict the kind of discoveries that are considered to be acceptable. This is unacceptable to the research community whose duty it is to serve the public good. Academic freedom means that the political, religious or philosophical beliefs of politicians, administrators and members of the public cannot be imposed on students or faculty members at a university. So in my country, Australia, the rhetoric of the evidence-based movement is drawn on very heavily by our government. I find it relatively easy to understand why the government finds this to be a useful construct. Since the government budget is not big enough to pay for all of the services that are required for the citizens in my country, so the government needs to develop systematic processes in order to justify what they will fund and what they will not fund. To this end, government bureaucrats have developed formulas to undertake cost-benefit analyses, and they've decided that these should be based on evidence from randomised control trials, a lot of randomised control trials. In my humble assessment, I don't think that it will be possible to conduct large enough RCTs to satisfy these measures, no matter how focused and determined we are as a discipline. And it is my belief that this is intentional, since cost-benefit analyses are designed to reduce the number of services that are funded, not to increase them to incorporate small, consumer-favoured practices such as ours. They've been created to justify the process of making difficult budgetary decisions about the provision of services in countries with ageing populations who are making unprecedented demands on the health and other systems which serve them. So whilst I understand why the government is focused on a drive for evidence, I don't understand why we, as a discipline that informs a practice, should be. I believe that governments also need researchers to make meaningful contributions to knowledge, despite the, face, the challenges that they face with their budgets. And I believe that both evidence and story are equally valuable to governments and to managers and to professionals, and most importantly, to the people that we work with who are facing challenges to their psychological, emotional, physical and social health and well-being. So my personal preference is to answer questions about how and why and where and when the work of a music therapist is helpful and valuable. And I am really grateful that some of my colleagues, you, are willing to do the other kinds of research which involves reducing experiences to numbers and calculating their significance. Like my colleagues, I am fascinated by brain scans and I enjoy a graph and I like Excel spreadsheets, believe it or not. But I usually find that stories are the most interesting and powerful way for influencing my beliefs and my practices. And I also believe that governments and managers and service providers like to know that there are numbers, but they also love to hear the kinds of stories that emerge from the research that I do and that many of you in the audience also do. So I would like to tell you a story today. And if I'm able to hold your attention, as well as my colleagues have been, then I think my point will be made that all types are even. I don't believe, and I want to emphasize it, that one type of research is better or worse 
and I'm not suggesting that stories are more important than evidence, just equal. So because I haven't got time to name all of the influences on the thinking that I will share today, I'm going to put uh, the journal articles up on the slides and in them there are hundreds of references of all of the people, some of you who are here, that have influenced this thinking. I've been involved in a number of studies that analyse the music and the words and some numbers to investigate the questions we seek to answer. To my mind, this combination requires a team of people with different strengths because it is very difficult to be equally brilliant at statistical analysis and subjective, interpretive, qualitative analysis. So the research I'm going to focus on today was undertaken with my dear colleague, Professor Christian Gold in Norway, and also Dr. Suvi Sarakalio from Finland, as well as my long-standing mentor, Emeritus Professor Denise Grokey in Australia. The research has resulted in a number of publications, but the one that you see here was a preliminary investigation. And I actually co collected the data for that back in the early 2000s. Now this study, which some of you have heard about, was interesting because it revealed an unexpected phenomenon. I made a discovery that did not match my pre-assumptions and that inspired another decade, another 10 years of research in order to find a satisfying explanation. In this small survey study of 120 teenagers in just one school in Melbourne, I discovered that some of the most distressed young people reported feeling worse after listening to music. I had hoped that the data would prove that when young people are given the freedom to choose the music of their preference, that they select music that tends to make them feel better. That is what young people regularly told and continue to tell me. But psychiatrists and parents often disagreed. And they saw young people sometimes feeling worse after listening. And they always asked me to explain it. So I tried to do that with data and numbers from the survey. But unfortunately, the data confirmed their position. And that sometimes it went the other way. So I therefore took these powerful numbers. And I used that data to argue to the Australian government that we needed to do more research. In my research proposal to the Australian Research Council, I explained that it was unclear when, where and why young people were sometimes using music in helpful ways and sometimes in unhelpful ways. I argued that we needed to listen to the stories of the young people and to get a richer understanding of the phenomenon. And I explained that interpretive analysis of these stories would be extremely important in considering the nature of when and where and why. And they agreed and they gave me a million dollars and they let me undertake the research. I'm using the word interpretive here rather than qualitative uh, in keeping with Barbara Wheeler's latest edition of music therapy research where she's chosen to use interpretivist and objectivist rather than qualitative and quantitative, just to be clear. So, the first stage of the collaboration with Suvi and Christian involved me and Cherry Hentz speaking to 50 young Australians and asking them to talk about when they felt better and worse when listening to music. We were utterly vigilant, determined and focused to ensure that we emphasised their uses of music and always talked about it in that sense. We argued constantly with our colleagues and with other researchers against the suggestion that music was doing something to these young people, as though music has these magical abilities to make people joyous or suicidal. But this was very important because in music psychology, many people misinterpreted numbers from surveys like mine to say that music can affect people in ways that are predictable and generalizable and that particular types of music had particular effects. And that's a belief which I do not share. Although I can understand how wanting to understand more predictable, generalizable aspects of music may be more relevant for the kinds of research that Dr. Chong was talking about earlier. But our research was investigating the ways that young people use music. And what we confirmed was that they nearly always use music to make them feel better, but there were definitely times when these young people were using it to feel worse. 
we also discovered a really complex interaction between their intention, why they were listening to music, what they chose to listen to, and what the outcome of that was. And we used a grounded theory analysis to map the different patterns of music use across these 50 young people. Obviously, there were lots of times when they felt better, from feeling more relaxed to reducing anxiety, expressing emotions and experiencing relief, connecting with friends and reducing isolation. We see that all the time. And there were lots of ways of listening and lots of music types. And we've described that uh, in this article, in the Arts and Psychotherapy. And I'm particularly proud, actually, of the grounded theory analysis that I describe in that article. For anybody who's interested, grounded theory nerds. But what we discovered was that often young people chose music out of habit, without conscious reflection. So they might choose music to make them feel better, but they'd gradually come to associate different types of music with unhappiness, and so it actually made them feel more depressed. Or they chose a song because they wanted to process their emotions, and they wanted to cry, and they wanted to feel their rage. But actually, the song had stopped serving that function of relief from expressing emotions and had just turned to rumination and intensifying their feelings. This was actually much more common for the young people in our study who were struggling with depression. And it seemed as though their uses of music had changed. So this actually seems sensible, but it challenges findings that have been based on studies of healthy young people such as Suvi Saracalio's much-quoted study of six healthy young Finnish people with her supervisor, Jako Erkela. But Cherry Hens's study of just 11 young Australians with mental illness showed that young people's musical identity changed as they became more ill, and that's described in this article here. Her study confirmed our emerging sense that mental illness impacted on the ways that young people were using music and clarified the role of the music therapist in supporting the recovery of musical identity. That led me to conclude that an important role for music therapists is to raise consciousness about the ways that our clients are using music. Whereas I had previously adopted a very humanistic view that assumed people were making cho choices that supported their own flourishing when given that opportunity, it became clear that was not always the case. And it was also clear that they were not very aware of the power of their decisions about music listening. This point was made most clear to me through a fascinating collaboration with one of my past patients from a hospital. Uh, also shown on the slide, Kelly. I learned so much from collaborating with this young woman, much more than if I had used her to collect data, but that instead we did this study together and this is an approach that we're using increasingly in Australia in the National Music Therapy Research Unit, particularly seen in the work of one of our brilliant PhDs, Rebecca Fairchild. So once we collected this data, my positivist colleagues were interested to see whether we could use this information to identify young people who were at risk of developing mental illness still back in school before they had actually developed symptoms or been diagnosed. So we decided to use the results of our analysis of young people's stories to develop a series of questions. Reducing those stories to 13 questions, which are listed here, took a lot of work. It began with anecdotal feedback from clinicians who were working with young people who we asked to use some questions that we initially generated. We then went to 187 uh, older teenagers at the University of Melbourne. We then went to another 211 younger adolescents in schools, and they all filled out a range of wellbeing measures. And that rigorous, objectivist process is described in the article that Suvi led here. We developed these 13 questions, which we now affectionately refer to as the HUMs, uh, and they're freely available on an open access article that we used our privilege to pay thousands of dollars to make available to people all around the world so that you don't need a library to access this information. It's freely available. And the questions are in there, yeah. That's what universities should be doing. And will, increasingly. 
So, the final stage of that study was to test whether the questions were indeed useful for identifying young people at risk of depression in schools and then whether those same people benefited from being a part of a music therapy group that aimed to increase their helpful uses of music. This was a randomised control trial led by Christian, designed in ways that do align with evidence-based standards and including a control group as well as careful pre to post testing using validated measures of well-being. There were small improvements for the participants in the group music therapy and equivalent improvements for the other participants who we gave $50 worth of iTunes vouchers and said, can you think more carefully, please, about your music choices? That publication is available through the Journal of Music Therapy. So for me, the most interesting thing we learned from that study was that it was not easy for young people to identify whether they were using music in helpful ways simply by answering 13 questions independently. A number of the young people who appeared to have unhealthy uses, uses of music according to the questionnaire actually didn't. It was just the way they had answered the questions. And I knew that very clearly because I was one of the music therapists working in the study and they obviously had very strong, powerful and useful relationships with music, some of them. We realised that the questions were helpful for naming the various ways that young people might be using music, but that it would take a careful conversation with a therapist for young people to be able to recognise these habits and something more in order for them to change those habits. That led to the most recent work we've been doing with the HUMS to explore whether using the 13 questions might be useful when integrated into a music therapy process instead of being completed independently and objectively. Once again, we've approached this in a really exploratory way, relying on feedback from consumers to help us understand when and why and how it might be helpful. These studies aren't published yet, uh, but um, they will be soon and so there's no slide for them. So we've completed three studies. One of them was at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne with Joe Rimmer, who is here, that I won't be reporting on as much today because we haven't finished. But one of the second one was a collaboration with Dr. Cherry Hentz, who is at home with her new baby in Australia, and Michael Silverman from the USA, where we explored the value of using the 13 questions as part of a single session intervention with young people in inpatient mental health care. We particularly focused on between diagnosis differences and the perceived impact of engaging with the questions. That small scale study suggested that there was value indeed in undertaking an assessment of music use with young people in inpatient stays. However, the 13 questions were much less relevant for people in a florid state who were unable to remain focused on this cognitive discussion about the uses of music and playlist construction and would obviously benefit from other forms of music therapy encounter in the more immediate moment. However, young people with ruminative and depressive features were more likely to have higher rates of unhelpful music use and to see benefit in discussing the ways that they were using music in their everyday lives and to be supported to develop new strategies for constructing playlists to use beyond the session. The second study, also with Cherry, who's still at home with her baby, uh, this time also with Asami Koiki, who is here somewhere, as well as Professor Deborah Rickwood, who is the Chief Scientific uh, Advisor of the National Youth Mental Health Foundation of Australia, called Headspace. And in this study, we tested the feasibility of using the hums for changing patterns of use, music use to be less ruminative and more mood repairing in an outpatient setting for early intervention. Outcomes of this small scale study were surprisingly positive, remarkably positive, with all 13 young people who completed the pre and post measures improving significantly in measurable, just non, not significantly, improving in measurable distress after an average of two sessions. And we did convergent analysis with the qualitative and quantitative data, which suggested that at least some of this was due, this measurable decrease in distress was due to their participation in the harms based sessions, according to them. What was clear through the interview analysis, which is 
what I did and what I had the opportunity to listen to these young people reporting was that the gentle support of the music therapists who guided young people to bring their habitual music uses into their conscious awareness was critical. But these music therapists also then actively promoted a sense of personal agency in the young people which led to changes in their music use and the construction of helpful playlists and an array of remarkable stories about young people who needed to have this information brought to their attention and were able to bring about significant changes in their lives as a result. So this is congruent with previous research that we've done in our group about the role of the music therapist in supporting the achievement of positive changes in young people's mental health in different contexts. Uh, this has been shown already by Carmen chong Clinch, whose article is over there, where her PhD investigation had young people describing how they identified, managed and engaged with their emotions differently, depending on whether they were in music therapy or in their everyday lives. And her study was groundbreaking in seeing that difference in contexts. Similarly, Jennifer Bibb's study with adult consumers of mental health services highlighted how the use of songs could actually trigger very difficult emotions for consumers, which is what uh, people are called in the Australian system, uh, both within music therapy and within community singing groups, which she was investigating. Adults in her study described how the context of the music therapy group supported them to make decisions about how to manage their own emotional responses because of the level of group cohesion and because of their trust in the therapist. So promoting awareness and agency seems to be a critical part of our role in the mental health context. Further study is needed to identify and identify how music therapists can support people with mental illness to use music as an ongoing resource in their everyday lives, as they have done prior to facing these challenges, but which may have subsequently changed. It also clarifies that resource-oriented music therapists have an important role to play in the mental health field and complement knowledge about practices that are more informed by psychoanalytic approaches such as those that are common in Europe and South America, and more cognitive behavioural approaches, such as those that are more dominant in the USA and Asia. But what does this tell us about the kind of research that we should be doing in music therapy and whether evidence or story is more important? Well, I hope it illustrates how important it is to continue investigating the beautiful complexity and affordances of music for supporting the mental wellbeing of the people that we work with. The reason a music therapist is needed in the first place is closely related to this complexity. And that is why we tailor all of our programs individually to meet people's needs rather than reproducing the same program for different people. We know this, of course, because we're music therapists. But when it comes to researching music therapy in ways that provide evidence, as Jaco described, the rules dictate that we reduce the number of influencing variables and fulfil the requirements of carefully controlled designs. Many researchers have been working hard to do that in ways that are meaningful, but I believe it's a challenge. And I repeat my statement from the beginning that I'm grateful that other people are willing to do it. But my hope is that you will also consider the value of both story and evidence in the development of music therapy as a discipline which informs a professional practice and works to serve the public good, not the bureaucrats. Specifically, the well-being of people with whom we work in a wide and diverse range of contexts and cultures, and I believe that this requires a wide and diverse range of research. So I'm very grateful to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to share about my research and my opinions, and I'm even more grateful to you for being willing to listen. Thank you.
Does it work? Yes. Well, try to summarize <laughs> all these wonderful presentations. Um, from all the content that has been uh, given to you today, um, I would keep two statements or two thoughts from Dr. Chong. The idea that research becomes meaningful when it has a real application, and also the need to balance evidence and story. From Dr. Erlika, um, I'd summarize, or the points that I would highlight, besides your wonderful study, is the fact that you showed us the possibilities of clinical improvisation as an intervention technique for people with depression and anxiety. Um, you made us aware and stress the need to make compromises in music therapy improvisation in order to be able to conduct uh, randomized controlled trials. And also you highlighted the importance of taking into consideration internal mechanisms uh, of the music therapy improvisation approach, such as the session structure. And uh, from Dr. McFerrin's speech, there were a lot of ideas and a lot of proposals. Um, I would highlight the idea that researchers need to be courageous, curious, and creative. Also, uh, the importance to listen to people's stories to understand them, important as music therapies. Also, the idea that music therapies need to be aware of how our clients use music. And also that it's important for us to know how, why, where, and when um, the, the work of music therapies is useful. And I would end with a phrase that in which she stressed that all kinds of research have the potential to contribute to knowledge. So I would like to open now the time for questions. I'm going to translate all the questions in Japanese. And uh, if the um, Japanese people uh, ask something, I will translate in English. Hello. I'm over here to your right. Hello. Um, my, my comments and questions is to Dr. McFerrin. Um, with a hearty congratulations on your achievements and, um, and sincere gratitude to your starting our discussion with the words of privilege, the words of the, the gold standards uh, of research, and your courageous statements uh, about the present and future of music therapy research. So first of all, thank you for all of that. I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said and support your research highly. And this comes from um, a researcher of randomized controlled trials. And I want to um, uh, let you know that in, in the United States of America, we're seeing a great deal of change um, from the Western medical model, the gold standard of randomized controlled trials, the, the, uh, the the standardized nature of research. And NIH, the National Institutes of Health, just sponsored a wonderful symposium at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC um, on music and medicine with noted music therapy researchers and clinicians telling stories and evidence. So I think that in the States, I'm very encouraged that we're moving in the direction that you are articulating and that the calls for research are now not just for randomized control trials. They're mainly for mechanistic research. They're mainly for feasibility studies, pilot studies of all models, and really mixed models and collaboration. So I think your vision is actually uh, becoming real in America. 
And I guess my question is, what is your next direction? And I would love to hear from all of the researchers here, the next direction in your own research agenda. I'm sorry. I missed the last part. What, what was your question? I'm sorry. Ah, OK. えっと、え、マクファーン先生に対してコメントと質問があの、いただきました。え、先生の大変勇気のある、え、研究に対する、え、ご発言、ご意見と、それから将来の展望について大変感銘を受けました。そして、え、統制された無作為研究だけではなく
を示すだけではなくてそれが一番重要なことです。Oh. Yes. Uh, At the moment, and it has been、uh, the case for a couple of, of years already, and I don't know when it will end. But the problem is that the RCTs tell if something works, but it, they don't tell how. how. And, and, and、uh, this is a bigger and bigger problem in the in, in,、uh, in, in whole psychotherapy field and therapy field because. Too many methods actually work. And, and, and what, if, if, if it's just、uh, well、uh, established and based on training and, and kind of、uh, treatment adherence, and, and, and you know, people know what they are doing, everything works, really. And, and, and it doesn't even depend on the theoretical or philosophical background. Yeah, because it is just shows that so big part of our work is relationship. It, it's based on so called, called common factors. Some, some people are saying, like, uh, like um, Vampold, Bruce Vampold, who, who wrote the book, Great Psychotherapy Debate, that only 15% of our work is really based on technique, and 85% is something else. And, and therefore, we have a high pressure to go more deep into music and, and to try to find out what makes the trick. Eto, Musakui Kenkyu, Niwa, Ma, Yoi, Tokoro, Ma, Limas, Keredo, Mo, Mondai, Ga, Alimas, Korewa, Nani, Ga, Ko, Yuko, De, Atta, Ka, To, Yu, 何があのあの、まあ、結果としてあの有効であったかということを示しますがそれはあのどのようにじゃあど,どうしてどのようにそれがあの出てきたのかということを説明しませんそしていろいろなあの研究法ややり方がある中で、まあ、そのトレーニングを受けた人がやると、まあ、あのいろいろと。<笑>いろんなことがまあ有効になるわけですけれどもそれはあ哲学的なその,その背景にある哲学的なことやそれまたより重要なことを、えー、明確にはしませんそしてそれあの無作為化の,あの客観的な研究というのは一般的な事実を示しますが、えー、そ,それ以上のことがちょっとできないという部分があります。Uh, thank you.、Uh, I must come clean right at the start and say I'm not a music therapist.、Uh, I'm a retired doctor.、Uh, a comment and a question. The comment is that,、uh, for example, in the study about EMG and、uh, the improvement in hand function and piano playing, when you played that last clip, we could hear that the piano playing had improved. We didn't need the EMG to tell us that. I wonder whether now evidence that confirms something that we can in infer intuitively now means we can say we don't need to continue testing that, we can just use our intuition and hear it's improved. So that's the comment. The question, which is for, really for Dr. Akila, is that you've talked about the importance of the improvisation and then talking, and that you found during the improvement in patients with depression that the talking became progressively more important. My concern is that a lot of music therapy training trains people who are initially trained in music and are then trained in music therapy, but then actually have very little training in their music therapy training in verbal therapy. But the implication of your research is that you actually need to be able to move into verbal therapy as well. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. えー、ジュー・チョン博士には、えー、その筋電図の、えー、ピアノ演奏キーボード演奏の筋電図であの非常に
向上したというのがあの見られましたけれども、えー、筋電図の結果がなくても、えー、聞いただけであの明らかに、えー、向上したということが分かるのでもうデータを取る必要はなくてこの方法をただあの臨床で使えばそれ,がそれでもう十分なんではないかとそ,そ,それで素晴らしいんじゃないかということで。をまあコメントとししておっしゃいましたそれから、えー、ともう一つ質問ですけれども、えー、あ今質問された方は、えー、音楽療法士ではなくて退職されたお医者様だそうでして、ねあのー、音楽療法の方は、まあ、まずは音楽の訓練を受けそれから音楽療法士になる訓練を受けますがその中でクライアントとの語りが重要ということについて語りを使ったセラピーにの,あの訓練はあまり受けてないのでそれがより重要になるのではないかということでした。About the music and talking, I, I think you made really important comment、uh, because currently what, what, what I'm doing and focusing a lot、uh, with my students is, is, is、uh, the shift from music to talk. And from talk back to music. Because when we are, in, for instance, improvising, it's, it's, it's non verbal, it's sometimes highly emotional. And I have noticed that it's, it's very difficult to, to, to come back to verbal domain and, and, and manage it. So, actually, I agree with you that in, in music therapy training, especially if we have methods, Where we are combining、uh, music and talking. Because we have also have methods where talking is, is not used at all. So、oh, the, they're purely musical music therapy, but most often we are using also, also talking. How to do it, how to manage it, how to make s h i f t I think it's a big challenge. Eto. えー、とても重要なあのコメントをしていただいたと思います、えー、音楽と語りの中で、えー、セラピストは音楽を使いそれから語りの方に行きそれからまた音楽に戻りというふうに行ったり来たりしますであの即興演奏は非言語的でありとてもエモ,ーショルエモーショナルというか感情的な部分がありますので語りに戻っていくのが非常に難しいということを体験する学生がいますそしてこの2つを、えー、まあ両方使っていくということが、えー、そしてどのようにそのスムーズなシフトをしていくかというのがあの大切だと思います。Uh, I think you're touching on a very sensitive vein for all students and practitioners because I'm sure we all think that we need more and more training in every single part of what we do. But my understanding is that we have equivalent verbal training to any other profession, such as social work,、uh, such as psychiatry, and that we use words constantly and we train our students to use words and music together constantly. So I'm not sure that I agree that we don't have that training. I actually believe that we do have that training, but we privilege. Music and the labels that we give to the subjects where we train. But when we improvise, then we learn how to talk about the improvisation and then we learn how to process the material that comes up in the improvisation. And in Australia, at least, to the best of my understanding, that is equivalent to any other person who is in a caring therapeutic role. Eto. あの音楽療法の中では語りをたくさん使いますし、まあ、あのオーストラリアでは語りについてその即興演奏などをするだけでもなくその中から出てきたイメージなどをどのようにこう、えーまあ、消化していくかというようなことで語りの訓練も、えー、オーストラリアではあの十分にさせますし常に、えー、演奏と音楽と語りを常に使っていくということを教えています。I'd like to reply to your first question. Why, why bother to look at the EMG when you can definitely hear the improvement?、Um, I think the, the understanding of the mechanism of music behavior is very important. What you've seen in the video was the, the, the changes that h a s come already. 
but in music therapy, it's not just like uh, a one-shot intervention, it's a systematic process. So we need to, is developing protocol, uh, what leads to that betterness, that improvement. And in order to develop protocol, um, there's so much you can do with so many keys and the keyboard. So what is most structured way to begin with and then to move on to progress for the client to reach that betterness or improvement. So in order to structure different levels in the protocol, we need some kind of evidence to see, okay, this comes first and then that should come later. And then that's what we need to um, provide to clients for the most, you know, best uh, outcome of the program. Okay. <laughs> のか I have a comment and question to Catherine Skews McFerrin about her presentation um, about the values of uh, and ethics of music as an art. At, at you, you make these articles and lists about unhealthy music for young people and so on. And I uh, think about the sociopolitical meaning of music for subcultures, for example, and and and. Uh, and how we can d define some music as a healthy or unhealthy. Do we have next literature that is unhealthy or dance that uh, is un unhealthy? I mean that there are other values to arts and music than just the health. And have you considered this in your wor work <laughs> of, of th this kind of re research, the value of music and ethics, how to use it? えっと、ま、あの、ま、え、側面というところから音楽をサブカルチャーと捉えてそういうふうにあのおっしゃっていますが、そうあの、不健康、健康、健康不健康というえ、側面以外にも他のあの、ま、考え方があるのではないかということです。Thank you for your questions, Ami. Uh, you raise an excellent point and I have a lot of regret about the choice of healthy and um as a word and Joe Rimmer suggested recently that helpful would probably have been a better choice of word and uh, you might have noticed I've started to slide that in and hoping to gradually move away. So I, I think your point is right. However, uh, we're not talking about healthy and unhealthy music. What may have been lost in translation is it's the uses of music. So it reflects the uh, well-being state of the person and the ways that they choose to use the music as being the critical mechanism. And the hums is actually healthy with a capital, tiny, unhealthy with a little letter. Uses is the U in hums of music scale. But uh, I still regret the choice of the word healthy. Mm. <laughs> 不健康、不健康という、ま、言い方をしたのはちょっと反省というか、ま、後悔しています。他に、ま、あの、助けになる音楽というような言い方をした方が良かったかもしれません。ただ、えっと、私が言ったのは健康な的な音楽、不健康的
oh, maybe this is stupid, it's a metaphor. If you take music as an art form, when you see the development of music, you have different forms and the analysis comes later. And the artist, I think he is not following rules, a good artist, when he is creating something new. And maybe this is a metaphor for, for music therapy too. Could be kind of like, a, like an art form. And so when you're looking for mechanisms, like in music there are some mechanisms how to fulfill a certain style maybe. But if you only follow the mechanisms, you fulfill the rules, but the, the tune is maybe pretty stupid. It's not really good music. And maybe with music therapy, this is the same. So I don't know how to research it. And I think it's really like an artist. You have, don't have the rules in mind when you work. But what you have in mind, you can tell it. オッケー。えっと、ま、芸術形態として音楽があり、そのそれを分析するっていうのはその後でま、あの考えられたことだと思います。そして目的をみ、めか、み、満たすためのメカニズムを探すということ、そのその方法を探すっていうことは、あの、
an award to study at Temple University, which I'm doing right now with great professors, which are people who I've read since I was little or younger, I guess. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think we can say as a recommendation or just to expand on this debate on a shift in the paradigm uh, to grant access? And also like to commend the Australian Music Therapy Association for opening your journal. That has been very important for my colleagues and my people, as I call it, in Latin America, as they don't have access to those journals. Um, so what do you think young music therapists like us and young music therapists at heart that are in positions of great power around the world can do to contribute to a shift in paradigm towards an open access for knowledge?発表ありがとうございましたということでそれからあのまあオーストラリアのジャーナルなどに自分たちはまああの若い音楽療法士があまりちょっとアクセスできないのですけれども今私たち若い音楽療法士がその情報アクセスするということについてまあどんなどんな
えっと、僕は即興であのピアノ演奏するんですけれどもそれで、えー、最近、えー、ちょっとカウンセリングな手法を使って、えー、相手の方の心に合わせて即興演奏をするっていうことをさせていただいてるんですけれども、えー、と博士の、えー、とフィンランドのちょっとごめんなさい名前が読めなくてごめんなさい失礼なんですけど、えー、どのようにその即興を,を、えー、患者さんとえー、とその音楽療法士さんが即興演奏を実際にやってるのかが聞きたくて、えー、質問させていただきましたよろしくお願いします Thank you for the wonderful presentation for all of you and、uh, uh, I am using the,、uh, I use the improvisation on piano and、uh, using the counseling method and、uh, I want to ask you from Finland doctor from Finland and、uh, Uh, he, he wants to,、uh, he used the improvisation and tried to match the、um, emotion or mood of the client. And he wants to know how he can do the, he wants to know the, the、um, concrete <laughs> way to do that. Uh. There are very many answers、uh, for this question.、Uh, first of all, I would say that the big challenge in terms of music and improvisation is how we look at it, how we analyze it.、Uh, when when、uh, we are recording, or, or for instance, when we have、uh, computational tools. For analyzing improvisations, we find different musical features. We can see some kind of progression uh, uh, along the time and, and, and during the pro therapeutic process, some improvement. But the problem is, we don't really know how to understand when, when something is changing in music, how it is related. For instance, to illness or other outcomes. This is, I think, one way to look at this、uh, problem. And this is also something where we don't have too much research at, at the moment. So, my answer is now only from an analytical point of view. I don't know if you, you others have. A it, it, uh, no. 演即興演奏のチャレンジというのはそれをどのように見てどのように分析するかというのが非常にあのチャレンジなところですそしてセラピーのプロセスの中でいろんな特徴が出てきますがそれをどう理解するのかというのはあのよくまだ分かっていませんで他の方々何かあ,のありますかという。Well, um, we must close this session. I want to thank you all the presenters for your wonderful work. For your willingness to share it with us. And I also want to thank all of you for your、um, attendance and participation. I hope this was inspiring to keep working and doing research. Thank you very much. Arigato, Jesu, Mas. <laughs>